So good afternoon, I guess, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Thompson. Uh, I'm Head of Consulting for DVE Solutions, and really is my pleasure today to be hosting this webinar, the first one I've done, um, and to welcome you all here. Uh, it's a Zoom webinar, which means that you can see us and you can hear us, um, but you won't be able to actually talk. Uh, if you do have questions or any comments that you want to add, you can do it through the chat function uh, on your screen. And if you have those questions, we'll do our best to uh, ask David and Pascal uh, as we go through. Um, what a year, 2020, I think is certainly not the year we expected. Uh, we, we really started the year trying to uh, put out bushfires and, and cope with the sort of catastrophes, particularly in the Eastern States, but also here on Kangaroo Island. Um, and then that turned into a bit of a travel ban for this weird thing called a novel coronavirus, um, which very rapidly became a worldwide pandemic uh, that shut down economies, whole countries and travel um, and something that we haven't emerged from yet. So I guess our, we are still in uncertain times. It's had a big effect on Australia and I think particularly on our universities. Uh, the world of face-to-face -face learning very rapidly involved to online teaching uh, in really just a matter of weeks. And the landscape of the student experience is very different this year to what it has been in previous years. Uh, I guess it also remains uncertain for universities, um, university finances, staff roles, the future of research and how the outputs are still reasonably uncertain. Um, but we do have very, two guests who are here today who are intimately part of that world uh, and hopefully will be able to give us their views on uh, what, uh, what we're likely to see in 2021 and beyond. So first of all, we have Professor Pascal Kester. She's Vice Chancellor and President of Swinburne University of Technology, having commenced in that role just in August, right at the beginning of the lockdown, the second lockdown in Melbourne. Uh, before joining Swinburne, Pascal was uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President Academic at the University of Adelaide. She's previously held roles in Adelaide as the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Professions, Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty, and the inaugural Professor of Marketing in the Adelaide Business School. Uh, she's an active and respected researcher in all areas of consumer behavior and marketing communications. In 2012, Pascal was awarded the National Order of Merit, and I do have that written here in French, but I'm not even going to attempt it. Uh, one of France's highest honours in recognition of her contribution to higher education, both in France and Australia. And in 2009, she was elected Distinguished Fellow of the Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy. And then in 2007, she received France's highest academic recognition by becoming Professor de Universities. I don't know whether that's even close, Pascal. <laughs> um, she had several visiting appointments, prof professorial appointments, including at La Sorbonne, uh, ESSEC Business School, and the University of Nancy in France. And joining Pascal today is Professor David Lloyd, so Vice Chancellor and President of the University of South Australia, a Dublin born and educated chemist who specializes in computer aided drug design. Uh, Professor Lloyd has refocused institutional culture at the UNES, at UNESA to make it Australia's university of enterprise and to shape its activities to better meet the challenges of the 21st century. Professor Lloyd is a member of the South Australian Economic Development Board, a past chair of the Australian Technology Network, uh, and now sits on the board of Universities Australia. Uh, he is the lead vice chancellor on that organization for research and innovation. He's appointed to the Australian Research Council, uh, sorry, Research Council Advisory Council, and is also chair of the Committee for Adelaide, which is dedicated to meeting 21st century challenges and opportunities. Before joining the University of South Australia, Professor Lloyd was vice president for research and later bursar and director of strategic innovation at Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, Professor Lloyd was chair of the Irish Research Council and prior to academia worked in the pharmaceutical industry in the UK. He holds an honorary professorship from Tianjin University, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry 
and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. So they're going to give us their thoughts today on the sector and, and universities in 2021 and beyond. Um, Pascal, I might hand over to you to lead off. Thank you very much, Ian, for this uh, for this kind introduction. Um, look, uh, it's it's true to say that right at the moment, it very much looks like the COVID nineteen episode it, uh, is a tsunami that it is absolutely going to um, to reshape the the uh, sector in a way that hasn't been precedented. It seems to me, however, that in due course we will see COVID nineteen for what it is, which is you know an unfortunate event, but a, a wave at the time where the king tide was coming. I mean, for some of us who were observing the sector, uh, it was pretty predictable that the digital age was going to upend the sector. If anything, COVID-19 has actually perhaps been a, an epiphany for universities to realize that the traditional um, respect that we have for the past, for the way education was, was done, was probably not a viable model. And if anything good has come out of COVID-19, I think it's the rapid realization of just the impact of the digital age on higher education. So I think, you know, there, there's something good in, in something that has clearly been unfortunate, but was actually predictable. Just like the banks, just like many other sectors before us, it was inevitable that the higher education sector would be impacted by, uh, by the digital age. Um, it seems to me that um, when your question is about a future singular for the higher sector, I would like to challenge this and, and dare to hope that we might be talking about multiple futures. I think if there is something that we can get out of this is perhaps a sense that the sector would benefit, as indeed the nation would benefit, from the capacity of universities to diverge in their mission, to diverge in the way they do things, to diverge in the target or the markets that they serve in order to offer the plurality and the richness of diversity, as opposed to perhaps what has been the result of the mid 80s last century, the Dawkins reform, which has more or less sought to homogenize the, the, the higher education sector. So in imagining the future, let me perhaps digress and imagine futures for universities that tend to be perhaps less steeped in the past, less respectful of tradition and less yearning for uh, an age that probably never, never was a golden age, but is described as such now. So what would the futures of universities look like? Well, I would, I would dare to say that um, given the way that in Australia, the research uh, activity is subsidized by student revenue, we're probably always going to have institutions that will seek to grow. And that's because at the moment, an homogenous model of development means that all universities are attempting to be better at research and to climb the rankings. And those rankings are necessary in order to attract international students so that they can cross subsidize even more research. To me, this is a bit of a race to nowhere. I would hope that in the future, universities might actually settle on a few areas of research where they are going to be world leading. And that as a result of that, they will calibrate their growth in order to actually be able to achieve this. Now, an important element of that will be whether or not the, the, the government and perhaps industry together uh, agree that there is a cost to research and that this is a good investment, not, not a drain on, on the taxpayer's dollar. It's clear that current government um, uh, approach is to actually try to continue that system of cross subsidization I would dare to hope that the futures that the universities could, could aspire to would be quite different if the government took a more decisive um, uh, stance on funding research for research sake, even if as a consequence of that, they were going to say that some universities should specialize in some areas and other universities should specialize in other areas. I do think that at the moment, because the cost of research continues to grow, um, the idea of spreading the research dollar ever more thinly is not going to be very productive. So, you know, taking the liberty of also adjusting for a government that is wise enough to invest in research, uh, to underpin the, the true cost of research, I think the future of universities would be one that is dictated by what society needs them to, to provide. So there would be some university that would perhaps specialize on medical research and others that would uh, specialize on technology. 
The name of my current university tells you which way I think mine should specialize. Technology, I think, should be a strong uh, part of its DNA, and it should therefore be natural that we should work perhaps more closely with industry so that they can tell us what kind of problem they are encountering, and we can then focus on finding the technology solutions for them. And I can't see why we couldn't actually have a multiplicity of similar missions for different universities that would then be appropriately funded for, the, for pursuing and delivering on the agenda that they set for themselves. Um, I would think that this future would be beneficial for the learners, it would be beneficial for the staff, and I think it would be beneficial for the nation overall. Whether we're talking about five years from now, 10 years from now, I'm an optimist. So provided we don't get too many pandemics in the, in the process, I think we should be able to get there within the next five to 10 years. Excellent. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you very much. David, can I throw to you, not for a counter view, I guess, but for a, your view? <laughs> yeah, it certainly wouldn't be a counter view. I mean, Pascal and I, we pretty much align on, 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 on the headlines of everything that we think is going to happen into the future and the needs that we can see um, for a differentiation uh, across the, the, the landscape of higher education in Australia. But I guess uh, I can reflect on what's been the craziest of times in, in my eight years as a vice chancellor here in Australia, certainly between 2020. And I don't think anybody could have thought that disruption was going to flow from a microorganism and a virus. The higher education disruption was long talked about, but nobody thought it was going to be disrupted because of health. And, uh, and what it did was it, it unveiled what many of us knew, but none of us really admitted that there are many fundamental flaws in the way in which Australian higher education was, was built. I mean, we, we have underfunded research in, in this country uh, where, where every dollar we, we earn costs us another 75 cents to deliver, uh, where we have um, a, a, a high degree of uh, cross subsidization between uh, education, teaching and, and research, and predominantly international education as, as what was lauded as the number one service export industry in, in the country and, and a massively important part of the Australian economy underpinned the competitiveness of Australian uh, universities' research. Um, so Australian universities can carry out one third of all national research, uh, and, and they, but they pay for half of that research themselves. So Australian research, which is and like 80%, well, sorry, it's more, it's more than 80% of all fundamental research happens in Australian universities. That's funded by universities. So the Australian, if you like, future competitiveness is funded off the back of, of the, the success of international education, which as Pascal pointed out, is on this wonderful circular, um, uh, it's not a virtuous circle, it's just a circle of, of dependence on, on revenue, which relates to rankings, which relates to attracting international students. So that merry-go-round broke this year, and not because of uh, technology, not because of some competitive uh, competitor uh, innovation, but because of health, and because we can't get people on airplanes, and because we have to close our country. So when I look at the 2021 and beyond, um, I can't forecast. For the first time in eight years, I can't forecast what my budget will be next year, because I don't know what's going to happen in terms of, of, of uh, access to, to, to Australia by international students. Um, I can't forecast how uh, competitors will behave in, in, in a market which has transitioned from face-to-face -to, -face to online, where if you look at in terms of Swinburne Online and UniSA Online are two very successful offerings, but all of a sudden uh, the advantage that our two uh, organisations would have had in the marketplace everybody wants to seek that same uh, activity and has, has, and has pivoted almost instantaneously to the provision of online education with varying quality. So it's online or bust. Um, that flows through to the built environment. If I look at the last $500 million, which was invested by UniSA in South Australia, 86% of it was funded by the University of South Australia. That, and that supports jobs and the economy in South Australia. So there's a massive dependency in Australia on higher education, and yet there's been a, a devaluing of education. The question <laughs> of whether it's actually relevant, whether people should attend university, whether university attainment is the right thing for the nation. Um, when number, like, number one, two, and three of our, of our export industries relate to digging things up and selling them, um, and number four is the one that has got intellectual input and actually can build a knowledge economy. So looking forward to the future, I guess I uh, have a few concerns. Um, I, I'm concerned about the pivot to teaching, uh, to online teaching at the expense of the face-to-face -face experience, at the, expense, at the expense of the, the, the Australian education experience. Um, I'm critically uh, worried about research and the sustainability of Australian research. And given the dependence of Australia on the role of universities in delivery of fundamental and translational and, if you like, near market research, 
what's going to happen because it's been funded by the organizations up to now and that funding has disappeared. Um, and that goes back to the competitiveness of our sector. So the rankings are all based on lag indicators. And I, this could be the high watermark for Australian universities and in international rankings. Uh, as we go forward, how universities sit compared to our international peers, the attractiveness we might have in the market could diminish by virtue of the fact that our, uh, our model was, was predicated on uh, international student income. Um, I think the, there are a number of legislative uh, moves afoot which are of interest to, to, to us as vice chancellors, but to everybody who, who works in the sector. Uh, I think that the metropolitan regional divide is going to become more amplified over the future because we have a metropolitan, metropolitan versus regional, um, I guess, uh, an, an impost which is going to drive metropolitan research or metropolitan enrollments at a lower rate of indexation than regional. Uh, and so, so there will be tensions between uh, the regions and, and, and the cities. And the most interesting one is about the decline of autonomy in, in, in Australian institutions in the next number of years. So the federal government funds about 35% of the total activity in the higher education systems in Australia. 60%, the majority, is funded by, by, by the institutions or is private income. And yet 100% of our regulation comes from the federal government. And regulation has been amplified for the last three years and will be successively amplified for the next three years, in my opinion. We've got foreign relations, foreign influence, foreign interference. We've got um, interviews, uh, reviews of free speech. We've got definitions of provider categories. And we've got questions about ethics and integrity across the board, which are really putting in place, um, I guess, uh, reins on, on the horse of autonomy in, 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 in universities in Australia right now, which we've never seen before. And largely are, are, are built around questioning our relationship with institutions that don't have autonomy but our autonomies are being restricted in, in, in a similar way. So I think that's going to put an extra burden on, on, on institutions. And I guess for me, um, I think Australia needs to have a conversation about the role of higher education, the value and the role of higher education in recovery. Um, because I think one of the things that we will have to get our heads around here is skills provision and addressing uh, a generation impacted by COVID and a generation of graduates who are going to be impacted by COVID. Um, who, who, who are going to face a very uncertain future, who will need to skill and reskill and need to be supported to do that at a very time when, the, when the, the resource per student is being decreased. So it's not being asked to do more or less. It's being asked to do everything but very, very little. And uh, we're going to have to address this as we go forward. Thank you, Dave. Uh, certainly some challenges there that are no easy solutions, I suspect. Uh, oh, no amongst that group. So, um, look, if it was easy, we wouldn't be here anyway. So, look, uh, first of all, thank you. Second, I guess the questions, um, there are a series of questions that have been submitted by participants uh, leading up to the event. So, I might uh, just sort of work through some of those and um, throw to you on, on them. I'm interested in this, this idea that, Pascal, you talked about uh, diversification and universities becoming known for particular things and and David I guess it's this decline in autonomy and do you think universities first of all will have the freedom to do what they want to do in this space but then secondly the when we look at students in the UK and the US they do travel from their hometown to other cities to follow their their passion their dream um, Australian students generally don't do you think Australians will accept the, the local university not being generalist and offering everything? Pascal, where do you, where do you see that starting? So it's, it's a really good observation and you don't need to go as far as the US or the UK to see this. I mean, in New Zealand, where I was before, it was totally um, unknown of a students deciding to stay at their parents to go to the nearby university. By definition, the rite of passage meant that if you were from the South Island, you'd go to the University of the North Island. And, you know, it was part of actually growing up. It was part of, of the learning that would come from being a university student. I was struck when I came to Australia about just how, you know, the students would actually remain in their, in their home state. But as David knows well, even staying in the same state means you've got a choice of institution. And at the moment, uh, you know, I'm in Victoria where there are eight to 10 institutions of higher learning. And, and the reality is that they all pretty much offer everything. And so what sort of choice does it actually give to a student to actually know that they've got, you know, 
X number of alternatives to do this or that course uh, without really a, a sense of differentiation. I think it would be to the benefits of students. And indeed, I think it would be the preference of their parents as well. If you could actually go to this university to do this or to that university to do that. And, and of course, there would still be, I'm, I'm pretty sure, there would still be merit in having the great generalist kind of university that offers a little bit of everything. But, but you know, ultimately, if we want to get industry on board, and if we want to really serve the community in which we are located, I think we would be well advised to actually align ourselves to the questions that are of most relevance to that community or, or, or to um, the public good. And I'm pretty sure that then the universities would actually naturally evolve to their, their strengths and to building up on their strength as opposed to trying to match what the others are also doing. Yeah, I guess I, I don't disagree with anything that Pascal said there. I think uh, I too was really surprised at, at the homebird um, disposition of students that who won't travel even outside their postcode. So if they do have choice, there's the institution that's closest that they'll go to. Um, and there's, there's, there's a piece of me that, that reflects on, if I look at the size of South Australia and the population of South Australia and the, and the number of universities that are in it, I think, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's well served, but you've got three comprehensive universities. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a surfeit of choice in that, right? And choice, um, even, even differentiation, specialization is a good thing, right? Because, you know, why not go to the institution that is outstanding in a given area, right? Which is, I'm making the choice to go to the best, not the one that's convenient. Um, we're seeing increasingly now, and, and Pascal probably sees this through with Swinburne Online, with, with national reach, you do get diversity of participation, which is based on ac people wanting to access the offering, the, the program which is, which is constructed, which they want to, and, they, and it, they, they tend to do their diligence about who's the best provider for what it is they want. So, so when, when we look nationally, we can see it, but when we're in our own local area markets, the school leaver market in particular behaves in a certain way, which is about the convenience of access to, to, to the education. Um, I think that uh, institutional autonomy to, to diversify or to prioritize has always been there. And I guess there's another piece in this. If you go back to uh, the Dawkins era, era which so let's let's say 30 years ago when the likes of UniSA was founded when when UTS uh, when the, that, that generation of institutions became universities it was an aspirant uh, drive to be like Pinocchio a real institution which means you need to have a law school you need to have a medical school and, and you can see that's still propagating now where people are still chasing the the trappings of of the of the holistic institution of, of the comprehensive university instead of saying well actually no it's great you know wouldn't that we much rather be number one nationally and in the, t in the top 10 in the world in marketing science and be differentiated than have yet another dental school or yet another medical school? And, and, and I think there's, there's, there's room for that. But the drivers of participation, the expectation of access and ease, force them to the, the economics of the institutions to offer these things. And then you end up with small markets being subdivided to sub products and then a suboptimal uh, I, I guess experience for, for, for a student. I, I personally and the way we run this place is we invest in strength and, and we, we stop things where we think well actually there, there is choice in the market somewhere else we're not going to do it. Thank you. And look at maybe an interesting segue there to a um, no reference to a background that the three of us share but there are 43 universities in, in Australia at the moment do you think that they will all survive? And are we looking to mergers um, or even institution closures over the coming years? Is, is there space for 43? Well, if I can jump in, um, just so that David can collect his thoughts on what is <laughs> a very interesting answer. Um, I, I do think a lot, of, a lot of it will depend also about the particular uh, implications of COVID-19. I mean, clearly, as, as David said, COVID-19 kind of really presented an immediate challenge in terms of just the prediction of your budget. We all experienced this to more or less extent. And, and it is problematic when you build a budget, you know, expecting a thousand students to come from overseas. It's completely different different from 2000 students coming from overseas and it's you know it's pretty dramatic impact so I think this is actually going to uh, really um, um, drive home the the definition of what is the level of sustainability and to what extent is that international um, revenue meant to be underpinning strategic 
things versus operational things that are you know, business as usual. In that process, um, it may well be that some institution will find themselves to simply not have a level of sustainability without international students. And therefore, the answer to your question would be predicated almost entirely on whether or not the international students are coming back. Because if they don't come back, I suspect there are some institutions, and mine is not one of them, but there will be some institutions that are simply not going to be able to continue to carry on the way they did. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, pre-COVID, one in eight Australian institutions was probably running a deficit, right? Before before COVID arrived. So, so the sustainability of higher education in Australia has been questionable since the introduction of the freeze. On, on, the, on the demand room system. Um, and that's, that was a policy decision which impacted institutions and that happened at the end of 2017. And, um, and had an efficiency dividend been brought in, which was, the, which was the alternative, I think we'd still find ourselves in a situation where you'd have maybe one in five institutions who would be running a deficit. Right? Um, a merger is not a solution to running a deficit. Right? A merger is not a strategy to get out of a hole. Um, if, if there's to be mergers, Actually, what you're really talking about, if there's institutions that need to come together for sustainability, they're coming together to, to build a new institution for sustainability. But just banging them together and hoping that you're going to get a better organizational you know, kick out of it, you might get a dead cat bounce, but you're not going to get a transformation which is actually going to address the root issue of sustainability of the institutions. And um, Pascal's absolutely right. I think that there are so many dependencies on, on which COVID has now brought about, which, which highlight the, the, the issues we have uh, around sources of revenue to, to keep core operations underway, core research and teaching, that um, there's going to have to be a, a, a very, very frank examination of offering, of sustainability. And I think Pascal's right. The, the, the solution here is not, not merger. Uh, unless you, there's an, a strategic intent to deliver something new and better and, 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 and recognize that it takes a, a lot of money to do this and a lot of time and, and the recoup, recoup is a, is a long-term piece. But in, in the absence of those decisions, we will see institutions uh, curtail their offerings, reduce their research pieces, have no uh, alternative but to uh, prioritize areas of strength and they'll use that wonderful, horrible term, right-sizing as they justify you know, FTE reductions, um, but but that's because it's an underfunded system. Yeah. David, can I probably address the the international thing head on? Then, what what do you think is going to happen with international students? Not just for Australia, but student mobility is a is a worldwide phenomenon, and and generally, it, there's been criticism in Australia. I think that we we were milking you know, Asian students and trying to just take them for money, but it ignores the fact there was actually demand for our education system and the fact that particularly in Asia, they saw the Australian education system as high quality and all the things that we seem to knock about it, they loved about it. Yeah. So are we going to return to, to international students ever in the way we had them? Um, I guess there's, there's probably churches full of novena candles burning, hoping that we will, right? Um, I think being more realistic, um, people decided the fact that we, we weren't number one in the world for, for, for international education. We were in, 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 in a global competition. The US outstripped us. We were competing with the UK. So for an English-speaking international education experience, there are other, other jurisdictions who brought in more international students than, than Australia ever did proportionally. And the number of international students we have in Australia is about right for the quality of the education we can offer. Them. The distribution across um, uh, source countries, uh, it became, uh, people looked at an over-reliance on Asia and then certain, cer certain uh, geographies in Asia became over-dependent, were, were superly dependent on, on Chinese students. Not actually the case. If you look at the, the way in which Chinese students access higher education in Australia, and half of them go back to China. That the ones who remain for post study work rights reflect the population of Australian Chinese citizens, right? So it's it's, it's not it's not a, a, a disproportionate participation. Where where we are, what we had was 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 um, a dependency on the revenue stream to support research and cross subsidised teaching activities and general activities of the universities because of the way in which the funding um, base was was constructed. Now that has been eroded because the students can't get here. 
assume the students can get here mid-year next year, we're going to have a block wave of, of continuing student depression as it goes through, and then it'll recover. Right? But what we haven't factored into this Nullum's Come model is the effect of a global recession on the ambition of international middle-class aspirant people who want to advance through education, who would look to Australia for quality education, but cannot afford to do it because they've lost their job in their home country. So um, then there's the geopolitical uh, lens about the relationship that this uh, government has with China and whether the participation rates from China would ever recover to a pre-COVID level in the current climate. Now, you throw those things in, and I can't see how we could give back to a pre-COVID level of onshore international uh, education in the short term. But we can through reputational, uh, our reputation is strong. We deliver good education. Our students do well. They're valued in society. It didn't help that the prime minister said to international students they should leave. Um, yeah. These things, they, 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 they have impact. I guess what we as, as leaders in research or, and education can do is, is actually uh, rehabilitate Australia's reputation as a quality provider of safe international education. When I look at Adelaide as a city, it's probably the safest million person plus city in the world right now from, from a health perspective. Those That's amplified out across Australia. And, and in, in, in a couple of weeks time, we'll see a return to zero transmission in Victoria. We have a great education system. We've got great offerings and great translation and a great community in which to learn. Those strengths can't be lost, but it will take time to get back to that level of participation that we have pre-COVID. Mm. And if I could add something, Ian, to this picture, it is the fact that unless they return, I think the Australian universities would be poorer places for it. And I'm not talking financially. Yeah. I'm talking about the capacity to connect our domestic students to a, a broader global perspective. Uh, we, we are an island continent. We have spoken before about the fact that you know, mysteriously in Australia, students want to stay in their home state. If they do not get a chance to connect with people who come from completely different countries, with completely different perspective, I fear that the quality of education we will be able to deliver them will always be wanting. There is something fundamentally global about the pursuit of knowledge and about the, the pursuit of, of, of greater education. And I think that unless we can actually get those international students back, we will not be able to deliver the level of education that we owe the young people of this country. Perhaps a French Australian and an Irish Australian would, would, give, you, would give you that view, but that's, you know, Pascal's absolutely right. <laughs> and I declare my heritage is Scottish as well, so we're, <laughs> maybe we're not representative. Uh, the, David, I think you mentioned before about the, the campus experience and um, what that means to people. And that, universities discovered that they could in fact survive and be quite productive with all the staff at home and all the students at home. But it may not be the, the position we want to stay in. Um, what, do you, what do you think our, our return to campus is eventually going to look like? Is, is, it, a, is it a blend? Um, um, or... Yeah, I, I think it will be. And I think, so, so we're back on campus and we're, we're doing face-to-face -face teaching and have been since the start of the semester. Um, the, 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 the flight from campus was interesting in terms of, as we acted on health advice and as the Prime Minister directed people who should, can work from home, should work from home, I reflected on my home that I had a billion dollars worth of infrastructure which had no in it, and yet I was still delivering the, the mission of the institution. Our research stayed on and open the whole time because it was all essential. Um, but it is possible for institutions to function with a, with a, with a smaller footprint. That was the issue, that, that was a, a major learning. And, um, and but it, it is a different experience. I think one of the things is when you change the experience, uh, the transactional experience of the individual who, who engages with you, from something with, that they expect to something that they don't expect, then they feel that sense of loss. So the sense of loss that everyone articulates was the camaraderie, the connection, the, 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 the water cooler movements, and that's on the staff side. And then the students want to have that peer uh, experience, which is what they expected to have when they signed up for their, their, their year in face-to-face -face education. So I think the future will be a blend. I think that we've learned that technology is a great way for us to deliver uh, prerequisite um, learning. It's a great way for us to have, um, I guess, stimulating online content. But the face-to-face -face component, the, the, the connectivity to the institution and to your peer group is incredibly important as well. And that makes you then rethink your footprint. So the tradition mm -hmm. of relocation, build a big building, move people in. 
I, I, I think our staff have expressed a desire for, for more flexible working arrangements, for the ability to work from home from, from, uh, when, when, when it works for them and when it works for the institution. So it's going to change our employment practices as well and our, and our working practices. And that won't be a bad thing. I think it'll be a way for us to, to enable people to have that work-life balance that they want to have. And, and students will choose. I mean, a student wants to be wholly online, they can choose to be wholly online. And I don't think COVID is going to pay to the, to the on-campus experience because the on-campus experience is at the heart of, of, of a traditional university experience. And, and learning from peers is as important. The innovation spark you get from being with others in a, in a physical sense, the way in which we conduct meetings in a physical sense is quite different to how we do it on Zoom or, 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 or in the virtual environment. Um, but we will see more choice and that choice will, 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 will reflect the blend. Pascal, you're at home, so you're you're still <laughs> locked in, maybe yes. until Sunday. But. Indeed, and you know, one of the things that I think made the case for online learning, which you know, a lot of people, including academics, perhaps treated with a bit of of contempt before. I think the the, the research is in that the students actually acknowledge that this is actually a good education experience mm -hmm. to do things online because it's self-paced, because you can repeat things, because you can, you know, all of that. But they are also very clear in saying there is a social connection that is missing. And so what the on-campus experience does is possibly not necessarily add to the quality of the learning outcome, but in terms of mental health, in terms of social connection, in terms of enjoyment and engagement, which we know is absolutely critical to students' success, clearly online doesn't do it. So yes, is it, is it blended? Well, I think it will, it will have to be. The, the reality, though, is that students, like everybody else, go through a number of phases in their lives. And when we talk about lifelong education and people who will come back to university to acquire this or that skill because it's necessary for the next career move, not all of them will be able to be on campus at any particular predictable time. So there will be some, some um, elements of, of the learner's life that will sometimes make them trade off and say, I'd rather be on campus, but I'm going to do it that way because otherwise I couldn't do it at all. And I think a, a wise, uh, mature university should actually be able to present those choices. You'll be able to do more of this. You'll be able to do less of this. Which one do you want to do? I think people are increasingly aware that they can't necessarily have everything that they, that they want, but that the university can be somewhat more customized around their own individual education journey. And actually this includes students who don't want a degree. You know, this is a new breed. Um, they, they are the, the learners that Deloitte kind of refers to when they say that some of their graduates don't have a degree and they don't care because what they want is somebody who's acquired a number of experiences that makes them ready for whatever the challenge of the position is. What if universities started to be interested in the people who are not after a degree, but are after whatever experience we can curate for them so that they can actually be ready for whatever their own individual future requires them to be? We haven't gone there yet, but I think blended learning is going to be part of the answer. Well, it worries me that um, uh, you and I are far too close because the next question was going to be just about that sort of thing. The, <laughs> <laughs> as um, I guess COVID has not, not a new thing, but it's probably accelerated this need for retraining. And there are a lot of people who've lost jobs and a lot of uh, potential economic changes and it's really highlighted the fact that a three-year degree is not an effective job change mechanism because people can't go back for three years. The, the sector, I guess, has played around with MOOCs and micro-credentials and short courses, but has really sort of tinkered around the edges of this. Are we in for a fundamental change now where we really do see non-award or, or short course or what in the VET sector would be skill sets? Yeah. as opposed to whole programs? So I've, I've got to say, I'm in a very fortunate position here because of course Swinburne is a dual sector university and that in itself means that the particular customization that I described before can actually start from a, any kind of point of entry. And I think the thing that would be important is to really build up the bridges between the vet sector and the higher education sector so that people can actually build whatever credential they need for their, for their career. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, if there's a case study to be written about um, one skill in particular, which is digital literacy, uh, we've seen it with, uh, with the teachers this year. 
you know, most teachers were defining themselves in terms of quality by their discipline knowledge or their experience as a teacher in the classroom and all of those good things that people recognized as a skill necessary to be a teacher. Then a pandemic comes and all of a sudden those teachers have to teach on their computer. And some of them had absolutely no base level of digital literacy. It's exactly the sort of challenge that I think universities should actually help society address. We should be able to upskill, reskill, and, and, and enable people who are going to operate in a completely different paradigm to be just as good a teacher as they were before, but not in a classroom anymore. And this is just one case study. I think it happens in the health industry. You know, nurses and, and health practitioners are going to have to learn a whole new set of, of skills. And as you say, they're not going to sign up for a three-year degree. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the growth, we'll say, will be a non-award, but validated non-award um, badge and in some way, um, I guess, as you say, a micro-credit or credit accruing non-award piece. What we haven't got is a mechanism to allow people to enroll um, because of the way in which the, 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 the funding structure sits. So, I mean, single course enrollments make perfect sense for a reskilling perspective. Um, but it's very, very difficult to do in the way because people have to be enrolled in a program. The program has to be a degree, a, an award-bearing program. So doing non-award is, 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 is hard for institutions. And we tend to think through award lenses when we think about these things as well. Um, I, I actually, Pascal really hit the nail on the head that that link between vocational education and higher education is another one of these things which we're going to have to iron out over the next number of years. Um, making that seamless passage between uh, the, the, the two uh, components of the, of the sector so that it is seamless, so that we move more like to a German higher apprenticeship model. There's an awful lot of exclusion built into the way in which we deliver our skills as well. You know, you, you can't in, in, uh, you can't participate in a, in, a, in, a, in a higher apprenticeship if you're involved in a, in a higher education degree, but you can if you're in a vocational degree because it's, it's, it's geared around an apprenticeship piece rather than a skills base. So a skill set is a great terminology because I think that's what we can provide to people. How we validate and, and accredit the skill is, is what the institution can say, the, 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 knowledge, the knowledge is there and we can demonstrate somebody's got it. And allowing people to access um, uh, content on, on demand, regardless of the AQF level is an interesting piece because it may well be that there's a postgraduate course in sonography or something, which is of value to a, a registered nurse, but, or, or to a nurse who's in training, who, who, who can access that information, who, who may be at an AQF level where the system would say, no, you can't do that. But with the right assumed knowledge and the right uh, prerequisites, they, that value of that course could be very, very, very high. And I think we need to look at how, how regulation prevents access to this sort of stuff as well. Excellent. Um, I think, uh, Pascal, it might have been you earlier that talked about the pandemic or COVID as being a bit of a wave and maybe it's not something that uh, will last, but it, it's probably going to have some lasting effects. And one of the things we're seeing now is admissions criteria um, suddenly offers based around year 11 results, um, bonus points because it's been a tough year in year 12 and a, and a whole lot of, I think, genuine protections for this year's year 12 students. Do we, has this accelerated the imminent death of ATAR or uh, where, do we think, where do we think we're heading with admissions? Are we, is, is it every man for himself now? <laughs> Uh, or, or woman. Um, a woman, sorry, yes. <laughs> Every institution for itself. <laughs> it, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because there's, there's always such a, such a strange discourse around the ATAR, you know, including the school principals being very critical because they can see the damage it does with students choosing easy subjects in year 12 as opposed to challenging themselves in the subjects that would be best for them to, to choose. But at the same time, the school principals are the first one to boast about, you know, the number of the students who achieved an ATAR of 90. So we have a very um, uh, confused uh, perception around ATAR. L like most things, if we can summarize to a number, we kind of tend to use the number as if the number was the truth. And we all know that the number is not the truth. I'm, I'm for the plurality of things. We, we as universities, I think we could be in the business of, of learner success. And so to the extent that the ATAR can be predictive of success in some areas, then we should use them. But at the same time, if we've got other ways to actually assure ourselves and the learner that they can succeed in a particular course, and this is one of the things that we did uh, through the non-ATAR entry process, 
then it's a good thing. But we need to do it on evidence. We don't need to, we certainly should not do it just to multiply the number of enrollments if it is going to result in students failing. There's nothing more uh, scarring, I think, for a young person than to go to university, have the weight of the expectations of their parents and of themselves shattered because they were actually not successful. So, you know, to the extent that we can build empirical evidence to demonstrate that a student on the basis of their academic result in year 11 will be successful in their chosen path, then I think it's perfectly legitimate that we should do so. Um, Alan Finkel in the press today was actually talking about, you know, the fact that we, we tend to forget that actually mathematics is a really good thing to have if you are considering a career in this or that. The fact that we've taken away prerequisites has made this task that much harder. And I think we probably, just like we need to sort of do a seamless um, uh, bridge between the vet and the higher education sector, we would do well to build bridges that are more seamless between year 12 and the first year at university. Because at the end of the day, we are all in the business of the learner success. It, it, there's probably a point of um, disagreement between us on this one. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of year 11 um, early conditional offers. I, 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 I think year 12 attainment is a very important place and, and completion of the certificate is, 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 is and, and, and effort expended in year 12 is important because the, the transition is one from uh, quite an intensive supportive learning environment in, in secondary education to one of self-directed learning in tertiary education. And the transition from some, somebody who, who, who has coasted through, if I use that in quotation marks, in year 12 because of, because of a guaranteed position, I, 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 I want to see how those year 11 progress as they go through in year 13 when they're in with us, if, they, if they've had a kind of a, a, a light year in year 12. Um, I think though ATAR, the issue of ATAR is one that ATAR works in, in a cap system. ATAR is, is, a, is, a, is a selection metric when you have caps. Now, we, we, have, we have a cap funding system, but we don't actually have a cap participation system. So ATAR as a, as a, as a rank selector for me is sort of a moot piece. If you're in, a, if you're in a, a program where you have a number of cap places, you need to have a selector and you need to have a differentiator. But even then, if you think about medicine, you need to have the UMAT, you need to have the GSTAP, you need to have those, those, those um, additional kind of like uh, aptitude assessments because everybody's getting 99.5 anyway, right? So the cutoffs, mm -hmm. you know, they, 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 have, they only have a capped piece. Um, I think ATAR, there is, there's, there's ATAR as a predictor of success. There's quite a lot of uh, evidence around that, that you can say that in an ATAR band from X to Y, you are reasonably well geared to be a successful learner in tertiary education should you apply yourself in a field of interest to you with the right supports. And it's up to us then to make sure that the, the, that the right supports are in place to allow you to be a successful learner. Um, so I'm not a massive fan of it, but I'm also not, I, I don't think going back too early is a, is a good thing. And we only admit half of our students on ATAR anyway, um, as an institution. And I think if, if you look across the, the bulk of our organizations, what we need is transparency. What we need is uh, transparency of admission, a well understood uh, communication piece that students understand that attainment of and succeeding in ter secondary is a basis for future success in tertiary. And, and better ways of transitioning through um, and, and, and supports in that first year because that first year, uh, I guess, shift in, in, in learning mod modality is, is where, where attrition happens. Um, and then you did, we can have a bigger conversation about whether universities have over-specialized in the degree offering so that students find themselves trapped in, in a program which actually they thought they were interested in and they can't get into something else mm -hmm. easily in first year. Um, yeah. So yeah. A, a more generic first year with greater pathways into other roots of education when you can go actually no this i've made the wrong choice but if i pivot this way with a little bit of support i can actually succeed i agree and, and in fact this, this is in most in some of the accredited program where the accrediting body force us to have a very scripted you know a set of of courses the result being that we are asking very young people who are not quite sure about the difference between this and that to make choices that are actually going to be quite determinate and expensive if they get it wrong and we still expect them to sort of make that choice in in first year which is really unfair i guess my last my last book bear about atar is it goes back to it goes back to, to secondary and the notion that you have to spend your atar you have to get enough atar and you have to spend all of it 
to get the thing. So, so, so the aspiration is, oh, well, you know, the point the data for that is 65, but I've got 90. So that's, that's beneath me in some way. It's not that it's the fact that if you have 65, you, you, you qualify for entry to this and you can be successful. Your 90 is not wasted in that regard. And, and there's this, this lack of appreciation as an education piece that we need to work with schools mm-hmm. to be able to say, you know, students succeed at this point and whether they get 60, 70, 80, 90 or 100, they're not, they don't succeed and to any greater extent beyond this, this, this cutoff. We might, I think we've got time for just one little, one final question. The work integrated learning has been a, um, a growing thing and it's probably always been there, but its importance seems to have accelerated over the last few years. Uh, but it's probably been knocked out of the ballpark by COVID and students being at home and, and all those work placements um, potentially gone or challenging to manage. What, what do you see as the future of work integrated learning in this new world and how will we get that right for students? Well, um, uh, as, you, as you know, I have a, a fair amount of passion for that particular model, not least because it's actually a model that is um, pr- pretty normative in, in Europe or, and can be also found in, in Canada where there, there is no, um, nobody perceives the education to be a lesser quality because there's been su- substantial chunk of the education that are actually uh, dedicated to, um, you know, in, in work kind of experiences. Um, is it going to be more challenging um, post-COVID? Probably. Is it going to be valuable and sought after by both parents and learners? Absolutely. Uh, is it going to be something that can actually be weaved around the professional uh, development picture? Probably. I mean, I do think universities, and this is you know, maybe a, a reflection uh, on, on the Australian landscape, um, the degree to which alumni feel that they should be part of what a university has to offer I think this is where we're going to test whether alum, you know, alumni just want to come to a party once a year or whether they actually believe in what the institution stands for. Because if they do believe in what the institution stands for, then you would expect them to, to be willing and able to mentor or offer internship opportunities or research, you know, projects of sort. It doesn't necessarily mean that the student has to be in the workplace, but working on a, on a real problem um, that an industry um, actor has experienced, I think would be eminently useful. And certainly where I come from in France, um, the professional grande école are all built on the model that you cannot qualify or graduate unless you have actually done these kind of internships as part of your, as part of your uh, journey. So, you know, I think, I think there is a model there that we should cultivate. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of work at integrated learning from a personal standpoint. I, I did a four year degree and, and, and spent nine months working in industry in the third year. I went back to work for the same company when I graduated and the first seven figure deal I did as a VP researcher was with the same company. So it, it you know, it, it's, um, it, it pays off. Working to learning makes you far more employable. Um, there is a component of the National Priorities Industry Linkage Fund, the NPILF, uh, which will focus on working to learning and, and the consultation papers for that will issue in the next couple of days. Um, I'm on that working group uh, with the minister. Um, so work integrated learning is at the core of, of, of a component of policy change, which would be supporting universities to, 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 to prioritize that. Uh, I think going through COVID, uh, if you take that generation who are not in employment, education and training, the ones who are coming out the door right now into a suppressed job market, and the ones who are coming through who are struggling to find work integrated learning opportunities, I reckon 2021 is going to be a year where work integrated learning is in, in, in sharp policy uh, relief. And I think we'll see um, a number of incentives put in place for employers to engage in work integrated learning. So it's not just a request, it's actually something that's supported, which is going to offset potential generational unemployment uh, if we don't get these students into their first uh, experiences in employment right now while they're in training with us. Excellent. I couldn't agree more with that. So, uh, and as a, someone who has a son doing just what you did, David, of um, doing a work placement in their third year and and then going back for the fourth year, I think it's invaluable. So uh, it, change, it changes their whole view of universities and, and education. So, look, uh, first of all, thank you um, to both of you. It's um, your, for sharing your wisdom and taking the time today and uh, for participating in this. I, I think I'm hearing, a, while there's some uncertainty, particularly around budgets and international students, you both seem to share an optimism uh, about the future of the sector and the fact that 
if universities really think about this and really, really position themselves for what is right for them, both in right size, sorry to use the term, but also in, in terms of right offerings and right programs that really do attract the students and work integrated learning and sound entry uh, methods, there really is a good future for the sector. Uh, um, I hope the research is funded appropriately by government and, and there's a change of attitude from it being a, a cost to an investment, but um, um, we can only hope in that space. Uh, but look, it's been fantastic today. Um, I don't know whether either of you have any final words to add, but I just want to say thank you that I've enjoyed it immensely. Yeah, I think we're both fortunate to work in a, in a sector where we, we cannot avoid being optimistic because we deal with the future and with young people and learners who are looking for um, you know, the, the full development of their potential. How could we not be optimistic? Yeah, I couldn't say it better. Excellent. You could say it with a Irish accent. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you. And look, to all the participants, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate you taking some time out of your afternoon. I hope you've gained something valuable from that. Uh, we will have the recording um, of this available and uh, Anne in our office will share with you how you can access that. Um, so thank you. Um, have a quick look at the DVE website because there's some other webinars coming up around uh, credit management and scholarship management, curriculum management, um, all the usual problems that haven't, uh, haven't gone away with COVID and all, all our challenges that we face. So um, thank you for your time today and uh, really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.